today the war within moves into alpha ian and tina share updates from the team on the story zones and features coming in the expansion oh my gosh the rumors are true holy crap all right let's take a look at this uh watch now war within alpha 27 minutes everything you need to know about war within okay let's learn some stuff here three minutes ago the rumors are true let's take a look Welcome to WOWcast. Today we're going to talk about The War Within, which alpha starts soon. I have two special guests with me today. Please introduce yourselves. Hi, I'm Ian, Game Director on WOW. I'm Tina, Associate Art Director on WOW. Hi, Ian. Thank what you up, guys Tina? so much for joining me today. Before we talk about alpha, what can you summarize about The War Within, Ian? Well, so The War Within, I mean, of course, it is the 10th expansion to well-known video game World of Warcraft. But even, I think, more special to us, it's the beginning of the World Soul Saga. It's the beginning of probably the most ambitious story we've ever tried to tell in WoW. Uh, so as you know, all expansions do, it kicks off with a journey to a new place. But really, this is going to be beginning to set the stage and establish the stakes for a conflict that threatens not just you know, ourselves and, and our families and those we hold dear, but the very world that we call home, the very world beneath our feet that's been home to all of our adventures. And if we don't win this one, nothing else matters. So this character has been everywhere. For, for those of you that, that missed out on BlizzCon, War Within is the next expansion. It's gonna be in World Souls Saga, which is like a trio of expansions they announced. They, 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 they announced the next three expansions. War Within is the, the first one of that trio, and they're all kind of linked together, like Ian was saying. For the War Within, Zelatath. She's purple, she's amazing. Can you tell us more about her? Yeah, Zalapath is, uh, you know, one of our key villains of the World Soul Saga. Badass. The expansion is, I mean, part of it is this journey, uh, delving deeper, find Zalapath and her allies. And uh, the inspiration uh, for her design from an art side was really based on the uh, priest artifact weapon that she had been trapped in for so long. So if you yeah, look at cool. her armor, like all the motifs of, you know, her belt, her shoulders, really take inspiration from that uh, design. Uh, even the runes on her cheeks. Uh, those are a homage to Nizoth, who freed her from the dagger. Ah, uh, Naifu. Yeah, so if later on in War Within you find yourself, you know, wiping to a raid somewhere, just blame the Shadow Priests for not just putting the knife down, yeah, walk away from the talking dagger, and we wouldn't be here. That dagger was always pretty yet, badass, I'm not gonna lie. Uh, are there any other familiar faces that we can recognize? Uh, yeah, some of the key uh, heroes of our story are uh, Illyria and Anduin. So these two, they've, I mean, they're, they're running a bit, right, from some of the wounds of their past, but in the end, they're going to find hope and redemption. So, you know, Illyria, we've seen her uh, new design that really reflects the duality of her character. And Anduin, uh, we saw him in our cinematic, and he just looks, you know, a little more haggard. He's, he's been through a lot lately. <laughs> he grows beard. <laughs> he's yes, working so. on it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, the name The War Within is one that has a couple of layers to it. Right? Obviously, we're literally delving beneath the surface of Azeroth and going to be battling within our world. But this is also a story that involves a lot of inner turmoil and inner conflict. And Anduin is probably the most torn of any of our, our cast of heroes, given what he went through in the Shadowlands. And his journey into the darkness as he seeks to rediscover his own light is a big part of the narrative arc. And with the War Within, there's new zones. Can we talk about what our new zones are going to be? The continent as a whole that begins on the surface and extends beneath the Earth, right, is, we're calling Kazalgar. This is an ancient home to the Earthen. It's actually just off the west coast of Pandaria, about between Pandaria and Kalimdor. You know, just a, you know, a couple hundred nautical miles away from a certain sword that's sticking oh. out of the southern end of Kalimdor. But yes, home to four zones um, with amazing varied settings. Yeah, uh, so our first zone, uh, the Isle of Dorn. This is Looks basically, lit. you'll find an isolated group of earthen there. And so they have their- awesome I always personally like green, kind of just normal looking zones, not like the super red ones or like the snow zones or anything like that. Like on the grand, you know, a Grizzly Hills. One, they just feel homey, but two, 
it doesn't make me blind when I'm trying to play the game. It, it's not like I'm getting flash banged every second by the snow on the ground. Like I need to put some damn goggles on or something. You know what I mean? Like this is, it's just like a calm chill zone. I can quest in, I can slay noobs in, I can world PVP in, and I don't need to put on the blinders. You know what I mean? It's great. Awesome city, Dornogal, which we're very excited for players to check out. That'll be the hub in the end. Uh, the second zone is the Ringing Deeps, so you know, the evocative of like mine picks, industry. And so this is the heart of earthen industry, but it's not all just, you know, lava and fire. It's uh, mixed with these beautiful caverns, cenotes with uh, light and water coming in, creating these, uh, you know, lush spaces for the players to enjoy. And then uh, we go to Howlafall. Howlafall is where we really uh, wanted to break expectations. I right, like this one. Uh, this is Arathi airships. Right, underground airships, right? The first thing you'd naturally <laughs> think of when you're going under the surface. How are they going to get around? Well, airships, of course. Of course. <laughs> And then our final zone is Ashkahet. So this is the heart of the Nerubian Empire. I mean, all pretty this is zones, where we'll finally be lie. able to see the Nerubians in all of their strength and glory, like with the height of their civilization. I think uh, we'll get into the details of Alpha later, but everyone's journey is going to start in the Isle of Dorne. But I really can't wait until we get to Hallowfall in our testing. You know, I think the you know Tina mentioned that this crystal, it is such a striking visual element that dominates the zone. Imagine in this place deep within the earth, a radiant crystal of light, and the way you know as it illuminates the surroundings that actually plays with the environment and some of the spawns and how the world around it reacts to it. And I think when we set out to create this underground space. Guys, be nice. Speak, chat, chat. Be nice. I. We all sound different. We all talk different. It's chill. It's okay. It's okay. We knew that one of the risks was that it could feel oppressive. That people didn't want to feel the sense of claustrophobia of you're always in caves. Mm -hmm. Hallowfall, really, from the outset, was built to be a place where. Honestly, unless you fly all the way up to check out the oh, ceiling above dude, you, it doesn't feel underground. Dragonfly it feels like you could sick. be outdoors in some vast, welcoming area that's just, it's incredibly epic. When we arrive to the Isle of Dorne, what's the first thing we'll see? Well, so you're going to see something a bit different in Alpha from when the expansion goes live. There is an expansion intro experience that is not currently being tested. It's something that has some you know, cool narrative elements that we want players to all experience together later in the year when War Within launches. But players will spawn in, in the Alpha, on the Isle of Dorne, surrounded by some debris that will look pretty familiar and pretty distinctive, and really is the scars of an initial battle that seems like it didn't end so well. Um, and the beginning of our journey, as, as, many, as with many expansions, is a bit of a mystery, a bit of an investigation of, of arriving in a strange land, having this threat that we face, these visions, these whispers that heroes around Azeroth have been hearing in, in recent months, but trying to understand the nature of the threat we face, how we're gonna stop it, and our journey begins on the doorstep of these ancient earthen people who are gonna begin you know, helping us figure out where to go next. They're gonna become our next allied race too, right? Once we are in their trust, that's for sure. <laughs> Is there any other NPCs Gotta that we know introduce now, boys. Yeah, they're gonna be uh, some characters that we haven't seen in World of Warcraft in a while, but will be, you know, part of this story. Uh, that's because of their, you know, dwarven heritage and, you know, Magni, he hears the Radiant Song. He brings some of his family members along. Uh, Moira, who is leader of the Dark Iron Dwarves and heir to Ironforge. Uh, she'll be here with her son, Dagran, who is now a young adult. Uh, Dagran, the last time we saw him in the game, dude. he was this pretty generic looking dwarven baby. But now, <laughs> uh, you know, the dark iron heritage is starting to show more in his appearance. According to my along calculations. With his personality. So he has a bunch of dude. these scrolls and books, like really showing that he has a very scholarly nature. I think one of the one of the fun aspects of just world building and narrative in WoW is we have this vast array of characters and champions and heroes and, and you know backup characters, and whenever we figure out where we're going, what the next natural location is, what the story elements are, the first question we ask is, who needs to be here? Who does it make sense to have answer this call, want to step forward? Just as when we were dealing with, you know, the Green Dragon Flight or the Emerald Dream or or the like. Okay, this is time for Malfurion and Tyrande to step forward. Now that we're going to this ancestral homeland of the Earthen with this ancient connection to the Dwarven legacy of Azeroth, this is a time for our dwarves to take center stage. 
All right, so let's talk about the eight new dungeons in The War Within. What are your guys' favorites or the notable ones you want to talk about? Well, so one, let's see, one that's fun to talk about is actually probably the first dungeon the players are going to see in their journeys, and it's going to be tested early on in the alpha. This is the Rookery Dungeon in the Isle of Dorne. The Rookery is the place where the Storm Griffins were raised and trained by the ancient Earthen over, over the centuries. Um, you know, dwarves and griffins go hand in hand, and the Earthen have a legacy of storm riders that you know we got to see a little sneak peek of if you, you know, got the war within heroic edition you might have been flying around <laughs> on that guy there's plenty more where that came from in the isle of dorn and so in this dungeon of course i'm gonna go back just a second um we're at 8 48 but the screenshot of like the start of iron forge got me thinking about something i i don't i don't know exactly where this is yeah right here um got me thinking of something Back in older expansions, like in, well, in Classic, of course, everyone would hang out in Ironforge, and it was just like this communion spot because it was one of the main cities. You had Stormwind and Ironforge if you were on Alliance. And then TBC came out, and of course, you had Shatroth City, but in TBC, people still went to Stormwind and Ironforge. Like, there was still real reasons to be there. You still saw a lot of people there. Of course, Shat was like the new kind of place to be. And then Wrath of Lich King comes out, and once again, you have uh, Dalaran, and of course, a lot of people are in Dalaran, but even in Dalaran, you had a lot of people still like dueling outside the old cities and that old world still felt kind of there. Maybe not as much as classic. And then in Kata, well, in Kata, Stormwind was kind of popping again and Ironforge. You still saw people like kind of dueling outside and communing, uh, but I guess that kind of makes sense with where Kata went. And then... Mist of Pandaria came out, and I think some of these things started shattering from there. But I think uh, wh what I'm getting at is when I, when I see Ironforge, I just get like this warm feeling like, oh man, like that's a city I know and recognize and understand. Um, and I, I think sometimes it's sad as a, as a longtime player when you hop into retail and you're just always in these new zones and you don't re-experience the familiar, right? So I think wrapping it back around to like, I want some like uh, I want to have to do something in Ironforge. Like I I like that feeling, right? Or maybe I'm just old and it makes me a classic Andy, um, which is definitely maybe a hundred percent true. But like I I like that feeling of retraversing these old zones and having some use out of them, right? Um, so yeah. Don't be done. Uh, okay. um, go back dwarves and griffins go hand in hand, and the Earthen have a legacy of storm riders that you know we got to see a little sneak peek of. If you, you know, got the War Within Heroic Edition, you might have been flying around on that guy. There's plenty more where that came from in the Isle of Dorne, and so and this dungeon, of course, is not all peaceful. Uh, it's been overrun by a group of corrupted Earthen known as the Scarden, and we're going to be on just beginning to understand where they came from and what their nature is as we fight through it. But one cool thing about this dungeon is that it's actually part of the main campaign as you play through Isle of Dorn. Now, I know some people mm -hmm. are instantly saying, wait a minute, I don't like doing dungeons. I just like solo questing. That's terrible. Can you well, solo fortunately, in 1025, towards the end of Dragonflight, we introduced this feature called Follower Dungeons. And we're really happy to bring that to the level okay. up dungeons in that. War Within right from the outset so that you can go in solo with NPC allies as you play through the dungeon if that's what you prefer. Or of course you can just queue up with regular with, with friends or random group mates through the group finder. But what this lets us do is- I'm trying to think if I, I like this or not. It's increased accessibility, especially if you don't feel like waiting in a queue or if you don't want to play with other people. But the reality is you're playing an MMO and if there's a way out of forced interaction with other players, then people will often choose that way out. And if you start choosing that way out, you're dwindling your player base from people that are socializing with other people. So it's a really dangerous and like tricky, like slippery slope, right? It's like, if you offer a way out for people to play solo in a game that's supposed to be the social experience and people start actually opting for that solo route, then the people that are looking for that social experience might have less people to actually enjoy that with. And then years down the road, when you look back, it's like, well, those social experiences are really what make the game for for the majority of that player base. I don't want to speak for everyone, but I think a lot of people might agree on that note, right? The friends, the guilds, the the PvP experiences, the the raids, the dungeon experiences with other players, they can be annoying, but they can also be fantastic. So I don't know. It's not like you have to do it, but it, it kind of reminds me of Warlords of Draenor Garrisons. 
they were like a really cool idea. Player housing. People want player housing. You have player housing, and all of a sudden, players just sit in their garrisons and they isolate themselves in an MMO where you're supposed to be running into other players because that's fundamentally what makes the MMO go around, right? You, you, you aren't playing in a solo journey. You need the help of other people, and other people need your help too, by the way, right? You're in this together, and that's a common thread. And as soon as you start breaking that, the, the feeling of an MMO starts to shift. I don't need that person's help, right? And that's something that LFG and LFR started to break as well. I can just get someone else. Oh, I don't need your help. I can just get NPCs. And it starts to isolate players and have players go on their own journeys separately. And I, I don't know if that's a good thing as I start to think and talk this thing out. Is where appropriate, we can really have the story flow directly through dungeons in a way that we couldn't in the past, in ways that at times was frankly awkward, because sometimes mm -hmm. major villains die in dungeons. Dungeons are places of great importance in a zone, but we couldn't really tie them directly into the questing because we didn't want to create an obstacle for players who really just prefer to keep playing solo. Tina, is there anything that you like? One of my favorites is in Hallowfall. So it's called the Priory of the Sacred Flame, and it's this Erethor monastery. So uh, one of the coolest parts is the final boss room. There's this giant uh, window that frames the crystal that is embedded in the ceiling of Hallowfall. And so I love, you know, the beauty of the room, as well as just how it ties in yeah, with sick. the narrative of the story as a whole. And another really cool one, it's the City of Threads. So this one is underneath the Nerubian city proper. And so it's really uh, interesting to see the ancient civilization that the newer civilization was built on top of. And just to think about the layers of Nerubian history that, you know, is in this land. Is it that the, na the ancient civilization back in like Lich King? Even Far before oh, that, it's even, even. Further before that? yeah, the Nerubians. I think you know we, we might think of them as monstrous or arachnid. They are one of the great powers, one of the great advanced civilizations of Azeroth, right up there with wow. the you know elves and trolls and the others that helped shape the course if you of, didn't of the know world's that, history. Jack, We've only really seen hints of them going back to to Wrath. If you ran the Azjol Nerub or Ankehet dungeons, you could see you know their buildings off in the in the background, but. You know, they were a civilization that at its height rivaled the High Elves and the Nightborn on the surface. That's insane. They were able to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Lich King's armies and win until the Old Gods and you know, their forces on another flank eventually led to the Nerubians being overwhelmed. But really being able to explore what they're all about is one of the things we're most excited about. I right? can't believe she didn't know the lore of the Nerubians. Like, it's <laughs> unbelievable. You gotta read the books. It comes to war within. Jeez. One of the things we're excited to uh, bring is an arachnophobia filter, if you will. For all of you out there who uh, could never, you know, go to that spider section in Nax, uh, you'll be able to turn on our arachnophobia filter and all uh, spider beasts will turn into crabs. So very pumped about that. <laughs> yeah, it actually looks, it, it, it works okay. way better than you might think just hearing okay. that sentence. I can't wait for players to you know, be able to jump okay. in, turn it on, and <laughs> You know, hopefully feel more comfortable in parts of our world. You know, this is something that when we announced the Nerubian-centric themes of War Within at BlizzCon, we heard trepidation from portions of our community who love WoW, but were worried they weren't going to be able to experience it. Honestly, prior to that, it's something we heard concerns about from within our own team, where there are you know, people who genuinely felt uncomfortable with these elements of the game that we were building together. And so- Wait, wait. They're they're making it so you can change an option, turn spiders into crabs because of a is that because of arachnophobia? Like, see, really? Wow. Wow. I I I'm I'm blown away. I just I I guess I've never thought of that. I've never even put my mind there. Wow. Well, what if someone else is afraid of like butterflies? Is there a term for like being afraid of, like, you know what I mean? What if someone else is afraid of snakes? Like, where do you end this thing? Interesting. Maybe arachnophobia is just more common. And since, wow, hold on. If you have arachnophobia and you would actually use this feature, type one in the chat. 
if you don't and you would never use this feature or anything and silly type any other number like how like is this actually common maybe i'm just confused here i don't know maybe i'm confused here that sounds like completely like kind of crazy to to cater to that but maybe it's a bigger audience than i'm aware of <laughs> i didn't know man i didn't know jeez wow i think at the end of the day there's going to be people that have uh, there's there going to be things and games that are turnoffs for everyone and if you don't like that then you can also just not play the game but maybe they're trying to retain the arachnophobia crowd that might otherwise have not played i don't know i don't know man i'm trying to understand that that's that seems insane to me that's wild so we set All out right. to try to find All a right. solution that would still you know preserve the fidelity of the game but really make it more approachable more accessible to everyone so speaking of the Nerubians, wow, once you okay. reach level 80, we're going to go to the new raid, Nerubo Palace. Uh, is there anything you want to speak about that? Yeah, this raid is epic in so many ways. Uh, one of the coolest parts is there's this beautiful uh, showpiece uh, that is just in front of the Queen's Palace. It represents the Nerubian race and it just shows how highly Queen Ansrek thinks of her people and herself. This raid will get one of the sections of the raid will get to check out her innermost sanctum. This is where, you know, only uh, VIPs for the Nerubians get to go and you really get to explore the dark elegance of her palace. I think, again, as we were just saying, like the Nerubians, we need to remember they are in advance. Like, like you could say like that's scary. This is scary to me. So is there an option to make it less demonic and the red eyes are scary and the, the red and the, the sharp angles are scary. You, you know what I mean? Like, I, you know what I mean? Yeah. Then, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Again, as we were just saying, like the Nerubians, <laughs> yeah. we need to oh, remember no. they are an advanced race. Very, you know, just this epic civilization. I think there's some parallels probably to going back to the Nightborn in Suramar and what going into that city. And that Bro, you guys remember the Suramar quest line? I, I don't remember many quest lines in WoW. But Suramar is one of them. That was such a good quest line. It was such a good experience. I remember it, dude. It was just good. Yeah, what made it so good? Like the story in it. The thing is, I'm not even one to read quests and I still remember like, like going into that city and trying to escape and get out. Like it was just good. Yeah. Interesting. I wonder, yeah. Palace felt like we really want to show the sophistication here. It's, this is not a monstrous supervillain lair. This is, you know, a, a superpower of Azeroth that we find ourselves, you know, facing off against. But yeah, the, the Queen Anserek encounter that Tina mentioned, she's going to be the end boss of sort of the initial season, the initial raid tier. Uh, the encounter team is hard at work on this one. I can't wait to see it tested later on in beta. Um, this is, you know, the, the whole room is really purpose built to showcase some vertical elements and you know just it's just an incredible yeah, set. I wonder if you could turn these into crabs on the wall a piece but we want to as always integrate the environment wherever possible into our encounters so you're facing off against both you know a very powerful magical user but also someone who is arachnid in nature mm -hmm. and how do we kind of deliver parts of the fantasy of you know scaling a web while locked in combat against the queen. Those are the things that we're currently exploring. Can't wait to see that up for testing. Does that mean we're gonna get tier sets again? Certainly. I think <laughs> well, last time we tried taking them away, I recall <laughs> torches and pitchforks in the street. New tier <laughs> means new tier sets. And these days, you know, unlike years- that's a, that's a cool set over here. And yeah, I mean, I think I, I, I like tier sets. I don't know, is there anyone that doesn't like tier sets? Like tier sets just kind of own. I think not having them for a while and then bringing them back was like, oh yeah, these are way better. Years ago, when you only had, when you had to raid in order to get the tier set, now you can get them from a wide array of activities, whether you're a raider, Mythic Plus player, or an outdoor world player, which includes now Delves. Ah, Delves. Let's get, let's start talking about Delves. Let's delve into yeah, it. Yeah, I mean, Delves are <laughs> one of the major new features yeah. in War Within, and I think we're really excited to offer a, a more structured progression oriented extension of the outdoor world gameplay that we know is the favorite of so many of our players and you know delves are these seamless experiences integrated into all of our zones where you can have these localized varied adventures alongside in the first season brand bronze beard either on your own or with friends 
Um, and finally, you know, get a shot at some endgame epic rewards just through an extension of the outdoor world ecosystem. I, I, I like the idea of that. Like, it gets you in the world and you can get meaningful rewards so the world feels alive for a longer period of time. It was probably the idea behind world quests, but maybe this one will be more successful. I don't know. Was delve the right word here? Reach inside a receptacle and search for something. I guess it is the right word. Dig or excavate. Could there have been a better word than delve? Probably, right? Like, Dell? I don't know. Yeah, maybe. I mean, it's it's pretty accurate, I guess. Yeah, we'll be able to get it from the Great Wall, right? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. super exciting. So one of our goals with building delves was we really wanted the player to just feel like they adventured, came across a place, and could just, you know, go in and see what... <laughs> Someone says dungeons, they already use that. Uh, scenarios, they already use that. I guess you kind of run out of words. Expeditions, they already use that. Plunder, they already use that. Um, yeah, maybe they needed a new word. Yeah, maybe I was the last... <laughs> Inside, when you walk up to the valve, there's this, you know, dark, misty door, and you click on it, and then it just disappears, and you just walk into your own personal delve instance. Oh, that's kind of cool. very excited about that. It's like that. Elden Ring, yeah. I mean, players are going to see, have that first experience on the Isle of Dorne early in the alpha. Uh, the first delve they're likely to encounter is Earthcrawl Mines. Sweet. They're going to encounter your good friend Bran Bronzebeard outside an ancient earthen mine that has been overrun with Nerubians who are borrowing up from the depths. Bran will ask you if you want him to outfit himself as, as a healer or as a damage dealer to help support you. And you'll venture in and have your very first delve experience. Um, you'll be able to choose whether you want to do it on tier one or tier two difficulty. Tier one is kind of the default. This is for everyone experience. Tier two is for those who want to opt into a bit more of a challenge because that's what they enjoy. Uh, there will be higher tiers that can be unlocked at max level as part of the end game and seasonal progression. And we really just can't wait to get player feedback from the outset, really all through alpha on this new system, on you know how it is or isn't working for you, and whether we can you know, really meet everyone's expectations from people who just want a casual romp as an extension of their outdoor world experience to those who want a solo progression challenge that they can really strive to overcome. I mean, maybe it'll um, be cool. Feedback is yeah. going to really help shape how this cool. evolves, but we're so excited about Delves as a central part of War Within. Yeah, I'm excited that we're going to be able to just jump in and get or like go solo with Bran, or you can have friends, but also just get rewards in that way, especially the tier sets with the Catalyst, exactly. and then that really cool mechanical mount. <laughs> yeah, so this is going to kind of be an introduction to the, sort of the Delves end game. As you hit max level, as you hit 80, and start to get a sense of the Delves ecosystem, right at the start of that, we're going to give you this epic customizable mount, kind of the, the successor to the customizable drakes you had in Dragon Isles, where you'll be able to, through doing Delves, earn a variety of different customizations and attachments that you can mix and match to really create your own personalized flying mount. So does this mechanical mount have dynamic flying? This is one of the big questions we had moving on from Dragonflight. Yeah, we had the question of like, right? well, okay, dragon riding is amazing. Mm -hmm. We're in, we can't get rid of this. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. But how is this going to work alongside of the hundreds of mounts that we already have in players' collections? Yeah, I'll just use my and how, From a design perspective, oh, how do we navigate okay, okay, a world never. where some mounts can fly in this awesome way and others can only do the old quote unquote static flight? Uh, fortunately, I think our art team was able to work out an amazing solution for us. Yeah, we were very excited to be able to make pretty much all mounts be able to dynamically fly. So even Nimrod's head, Ian, we figured it out. <laughs> we made it work. So oh, nice. I'm really excited to see Nimrod's <laughs> nice. head going like super said. fast. <laughs> <laughs> Another feature coming in the War Within That's that cool. I'm really excited about, think, as well yeah. as a lot of other people, is warbands. Yeah, warbands. I mean, again, I think as I summarized it at BlizzCon, it's just account-wide everything, mm -hmm. almost everything. Uh, it, this, you know, players increasingly play multiple characters and this is something we've heard loud and clear that all right I, i'm gonna have an unpopular opinion here and i i can i can see why a lot of people would disagree with me on this i personally missed the days where everyone had a main and that class identity was strong i miss opening sidu stream and watching him on a shaman period I miss opening Hydra's stream and just seeing that priest perfection, right? I miss opening like Peekaboo's stream and just seeing him on that rogue. In a tournament, you see Pika on the rogue, right? You see, you see um, Sam I am on that mage, not just rerolling what's fought him every week.
I'm going to play an Ellie Shaman because it's the best. I'm going to play a Holy Priest because it's the best. I'm going to play a Pally because it's the best. And because people want to fought him reroll, then you allow the catch-ups to be much quicker and then play a bunch of alts. I know that this is going to be a pretty unpopular opinion because I know a lot of people like alts. And I'm pretty biased. I mean, look at my <laughs> look at my login screen on World of Warcraft Classic Season of Discovery, right? I have one character. I know a lot of people like alts, and I and I, and I get that and I understand that. I just I I think I fundamentally miss the idea of like having a conversation of someone like with someone in like TBC and it's like, what do you mean? And it's like I mean a warlock, and this is what I'm getting good at, and this is like what it takes to master a warlock, and this is what it takes to be a warlock, and like you just. I, I, I think there's something different and like in, in, in classic WoW, let's be honest, there wasn't enough time to have alts because the game was like, there, there wasn't like the um, accessibility and knowledge we have today. So you would spend like your entire day on one character and you wouldn't have, you, even get to the end. Like how many people cleared Nax in classic, right? And then in, in TBC, once again, most 99% of people didn't really have like max level alts. They raided on multiple characters on a TBC, right? They just didn't, they had one character and then same thing kind of in Wrath and then when did alts become a thing? Was it Kata? Not even really in Kata. It was more in Mop. Not even really in Mop. It was more almost in Warlords, where everyone had an alt. Um, anyway, I get it. People like it. You want to play different classes and experience different things. World of Warcraft's devs are hearing you, and they're making it more accessible so that you can play all your characters all the time. And I, to be honest, if that's what everyone wants, I actually think it's probably a good idea. But personally, all I'm saying is I do miss the days and maybe they're just gone, of, of seeing someone master one class and you play, you play that class because that's the class that you like and that's the class that you play and whatever. But, but hey, man, um, I guess I, I, I definitely, definitely, definitely see both sides. But I think I, I, miss, I, I sound like a boomer here, but I miss the days where we had that mastery. You know, the game needs to be more alt-friendly. The players want to be able to choose where they spend their time across their different characters instead of feeling like they have to reprogress everything individually. And so, yeah, the Warband is just, it is your account in its entirety. It is your collection of champions. Whether it makes they're sense. Horde they're taking it that way. It does. What realm it does. they're on, they're all part of the same Warband, which gives access to various shared progression systems. And then you get to see all of your favorites on, uh, you know, one screen together. So uh, in our new UI, we'll have warbands, and you'll be like, you know. So like the login screen is gonna have all your characters hanging around a campfire. What what other game does this? Like Diablo, Poe? Uh, where do, where is this? Uh, Dark and Darker? Yeah, there's Lost Ark. Yeah, there's other games that do this, and like the. The, the point of the game isn't necessarily to have one main character. The point of the game is to to play through the game on... Oh, yeah, Lost Ark is the one I was thinking of, is, is to play through the... Like, you're, you're supposed to have alts because that's part of how the ecosystem of the game actually works. I mean, if enough players want that, then I guess that's fine. Move four up into that space and see them all hanging out around a campfire. Is that on the character select screen? Yeah, the character select oh, screen. Oh, cool. Yeah. That's going to be totally different than what we're used to logging in. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. You'll, you'll know, like, this is a completely different world. It's a completely different welcome into World of Warcraft. Um, what we showed off at BlizzCon was just actually a UI mock-up, but we're excited to see people react to the real thing. And really, as with everything else, you know, warbands are a foundation. They're, this is a system that we want to build the next generations of World of Warcraft on. Now, in 2004, WoW launched with everything character-based. Right. In 2024, WoW is going to shift to everything being account-based. And it, we can't wait to hear feedback about what other areas we can boomer, expand upon here. And that's going to shape not just War Within, but later updates and expansions. And we're just, you know, just excited about this platform that better reflects the way our players are looking to play World of Warcraft today. You can't forget about PvP. Let's talk about it. Yay! Yeah. Uh, so we have a new battleground called the Deep Hall. This okay. one is earthen Deep themed. Hall, it's a bit of a mashup between uh, Silver Shard Mines Silver and Arathi Basin. So you know, hold some points, push some carts. Uh, we're really excited to see how players uh, navigate around this one. Yeah, and in terms of how players yeah. are interacting with it, um, there is an overhaul to our rated battleground system that is coming okay. with I War Within. Solo queue or something? Uh, people who've been paying attention over the course of Dragonflight have checked out our uh, battleground blitz, our kind of brawl that was testing out a 8v8 solo queue rated battleground format. We're happy to move to that as a default for how rated battlegrounds are going to work going forward. I think we're really excited to make that battleground experience that personally I've always felt is 
the best part. Wait, 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 wait. Can you not pre-made RBGs? The default is 8v8 solo and you can't pre-made? Am I misunderstanding this? As a default? So you can't play with a team? Or maybe I'm misunderstanding. Here, I'll, maybe I'll let him finish. Part of WoW PvP, the larger scale, more cooperative, objective-based, um, you know, collaborative, competitive setting, as opposed to the deathmatch style in Arena, so, to make that more accessible to everyone who, you know, loves Battlegrounds, loves PvP. Um, we know, you know, it's a bit overdue, honestly, us mm -hmm. adding a new Battleground map into the rotation. And we're excited to do more of this going forward. We're excited to have a new framework that can make Battlegrounds more central to the end game rewarding part of PvP. And yeah, this is just you know, the beginning of a new chapter. Another feature in the... I don't know. I don't, I don't know what that actually means. The, the clarification never came. I, does that mean you by default you can play solo, but then you can still make pre-made separately? Or does that mean pre-mates are gone and the default is just solo 8v8 RBGs? It's hard to tell. Do you guys, can you guys understand what's going on here? Nobody knows, two separate brackets, both. Uh, it's in the game, just go try it. So there's both. No way pre-mates are gone. Okay, so there's both still. Just to be clear, you can do both. Okay. Does anyone even Q rated Battlegrounds already? Honestly, um, RBGs right now are pretty dead. I don't like to use that word very often because it's like, well, what does dead mean? How many people are actually playing to consider something dead? But RBGs, I think there's literally like hundreds of them being played per week. And with a game with millions of players, like the, yeah, the numbers there are pretty low. Um, and, and that's coming from someone who like, I, I lo I've loved RBGs for like a decade. Like that, that was my thing. And yeah. Um, Let's talk solo queue RBGs for a second. Solo queue 8v8 RBGs. I don't want to be too knee jerk. I want to maybe play and experience them and see how it actually happens. But my knee jerk reaction to this is if you're one player in eight, how are you ever going to impact a game enough to climb MMR? Maybe that's pessimistic. Maybe that's not true. But I think of solo shuffle, you're one player in three. Your 33% of your team's firepower. And it's still hard to climb. You can get stuck in ELO hell because in one and three, it's hard to have enough impact sometimes to climb. You can, though. I'm not saying it's impossible. And then I think of League of Legends. You're one and five. Right? Is there two bot, one middle, one top, one jungle? Five. Um, you're one and five. And you can get stuck in ELO hell, and it's really hard sometimes to climb, but you can, it's just, it's, it's hard sometimes, because you're one player in five. If your four teammates kind of aren't great, it's going to be tough. Now I think of RBGs. One in eight. My, my reaction is like, is it, is it going to be even possible, or how long is it going to take for a good player to rise in one of eight to break through as a healer you can yeah as a healer it might be even a little easier because you could just make sure your team doesn't die but say you're like a a base sitter say you're like a hunter like a you're a base sitting hunter and every every game you join you're like i'll sit this base and like you know what i mean i feel like it's just gonna be tough i feel like people might just be stuck and if you're stuck and you're not progressing then it gets boring. And we've talked about this before. If you're playing a game mode and you don't see some type of progression over the time you're putting in, you're probably going to quit eventually. It's important to see that progression, right? That's the whole MMR discussion and debates and debacles on social media that we've seen over the past couple of years start firing up. It's like we need that progression for people to stay excited. And my, my, my worry is that it's going to be really hard or impossible to see progression in a one player to see the to see the impact that one player can have on an 8v8 battleground i don't know i don't know maybe i'm wrong that's my that's my knee-jerk reaction okay that's my that's like what it feels like first the war within is hero talent so we've been having a lot of articles talking about them what are some of the other things that we can expect with the hero talents coming forward well i can say there's gonna be no more blogs and articles 
releasing hero talents because they'll be there for you to jump in and play. And I think that's you know the, mo the most exciting thing. We're so grateful to the community for all of the feedback and discussion in recent months, going back to the first blog in December. This really helped us shape this central feature of how people's class gameplay is going to evolve. Um, you're going to see hero talents that you haven't yet seen for the trees that we haven't discussed previously. And for many of the ones that we have released, you'll log in and see changes that are directly shaped by your feedback, uh, by what we heard loud and clear in some cases about what was and wasn't exciting. Um, we, we've committed to have as many of these playable right from the outset as possible. We will have 100% of the hero talent trees available and playable not long into alpha. Cool. And then the rest of the journey is going to be about iteration, tuning, and really just dialing it all in frost to make fire. the polished experience. Your damaging fire spells generate a stack of fire mastery and frost spells generate one stack of frost mastery. Fire mastery increases your haste, frost mastery increases your mastery. Dude. I, one of the things I've been enjoying the most about Season of Discovery is playing Frost, in, in Phase 3 specifically, is playing Frostfire Mage. I don't know what it is, but something is fundamentally cool about Frost and Fire coming together to do damage, because they're opposites. And like, in Season of Discovery, you can use Ignite and synergize it with Shatter and Ice Shard. So you get like a guaranteed crit or a, a high crit chance with a big crit, and then that big crit turns into an Ignite Dot. It's just so cool. So I'm, I'm happy they're uh, kind of playing on that in Saad. It's that everyone is excited about. So what are we doing with professions in The War Within? Uh, I think when we really overhauled professions in Dragonflight, we saw that as, as a kind of a permanent shift in how professions were going to work going forward. So you can expect you know, new recipes, different enchants, but the same fundamental sort of progression and structure to professions that you saw in Dragonflight. One big piece of feedback that we heard throughout Dragonflight, though, was a bit of frustration with the work order system from crafters who were just looking to complete quests, looking to skill up, but found themselves competing and often racing to grab work orders with their fellow crafters. Um, so what we're excited to offer is a baseline availability of basically NPC crafting orders. Uh, so it could be you know Earthen in Isle of Dorn who need a hammer made or need a helmet made, and they're constantly putting their offer, oh, their okay. work orders up onto the, onto the market, so that there's always something for you to grab. The player ones will still be more lucrative, but there should always be that baseline availability if you just want to skill up, you just want to practice your trade skill. It seems like they're taking active steps into making the game less social, but making it more accessible. Solo queue. Solo RBGs, leveling solo, solo delves, solo crafting. It's like if you don't want to interact with people, you don't have to. And I guess going back to my point from earlier, maybe I'm off here, but I think the necessity to band together with players to take out a common goal or to achieve a common goal is what makes an MMO an MMO, right? Like having to party, like you think of classic WoW and why one of the things that was so nice is having to party with other people to take down a world boss or to take down an elite quest because you had to. And if not, then you couldn't. So it's like, do you want to party? And then that, that forces some type of social interaction. And that social interaction is what breeds meaningful memories and excitement for the game, right? I, I don't know. It's a trade-off, right? You have more accessibility because you can play solo, but you have less social interaction. Arguments can be made for both sides. I think I'm more on the side of that social interaction is what makes the game good in the first place. And having that as a necessity to, to build on is, is, is pretty important for the ecosystem of the game itself. And there's also some cool potential for narrative tie-ins, the ability to have quests that now can point you towards that system because we can count on it always being there. So with Dragonflight and the profession overhaul, there was also a UI overhaul. Is there anything we're going to see with The War Within? Yeah, so the UI overhaul, it's basically a... Another UI overhaul. Okay. Continued improvements that we want to make over okay. time. One of the things that I'm very excited about is the uh, quest bang over, uh, overhaul. So we're going to have a bunch of new icons that will make uh, what type of quest it is much more clear. Okay. One of the new ones that you'll see is one that's like we consider an important. Oh yeah, I saw this when I was playing. Uh, what was I doing? The the PTR for uh, ten two seven. I saw this. And I was like, oh, that's interesting. One. These aren't campaign, but they're pretty important to your character. For instance, some uh, that that's must 
can do actually, ones yeah. for your profession or ones where you're going to unlock the revival catalyst. Yeah, like don't, yeah, don't skip as we these. lean yeah. more and more into outdoor world gameplay and varied gameplay there, different types of public events over the course of Dragonflight. Honestly, we reached a point about halfway through Dragonflight where we just took a look at our map and kind of recoiled in horror at the number of different icons that were there. And it was just a kind of icon soup situation that made us say, like, it's kind of at this point, we've advanced far past the world of, oh, you just have some daily quests or world quests here. We need a clearer visual language. And so really excited to just yeah. evolve that central interface that players <clears throat> use to log in and see what there is to do in WoW on a given day. So that covers the War Within, and the alpha is starting extremely soon. Pretty much working on getting it stood up <laughs> as we speak, as we sit here right now. And yeah, so the way this is going to work is pretty similar to the Dragonflight Alpha for those who, who followed that, where really each week, each new build that we release, we're focusing on a different piece of War Within to concentrate player feedback and our attention to just really get all that feedback in and maximize the quality. So we're going to start off zone by zone, level band by level band. This first week is going to be the Isle of Dorne, level 70 to 73 or so, the dungeon and delves there, as well as universal systems like Hero Talents. With successive alpha builds, we'll move on to other zones, other portions of War Within, um, inviting more waves of people. If you haven't gone to the website to opt in yet, that's a great reminder <laughs> to do so. Um, we you know, really pick from, really, true, there's no secret to it. We're just randomly pulling lots of folks in. Hopefully I randomly get picked, guys. I would love to check it out. And hope to get, by the end of this, countless people into our testing. Um, once we've gotten through all of those rounds of focus testing, we'll move into our beta phase, which really is an end-to-end -end holistic test of War Within from 70 all the way to 80 and the okay. end game and beyond. And throughout, you know, feedback, bug reports, suggestions, all of this is instrumental mm -hmm. to helping turn what we have now into the finished product that we want to be the best it possibly can be for all of our players later this year. Thank Sweet. you so much for joining me for The War Within. And thank you for joining us for this. Really, this is one of the most exciting times I love sit down ever chats. for the it's development awesome, yeah. team. When we get to pull back the curtain and welcome you all into this world that we've been building in the last few years. So can't wait to see you in the alpha. And can't wait to hear all of your feedback. Honestly, I really like this. I like when we sit down and chat uh, and, and I can hear the devs' thoughts on the direction they want to take the game and why. Because even if I disagree with them, clearly I disagreed with a lot of the points, I can still understand why they're doing it. And it helps me as a as a consumer and as a player to be like, okay, yeah, I guess that kind of makes sense. Maybe that's not what I want, but it kind of makes sense for the vision in the, of the game, or at least I can see what they're testing for the vision of the game. And maybe it's going to be a failed test. Maybe I'm right. Or maybe I'm completely wrong and it's going to and it's going to be amazing and players are going to love it. Um, but yeah, regardless, I like the like the communication, the feedback, and I am looking forward to the alpha. But uh, yeah, there, I mean, man, there's lots of stuff in here. I think there was some W's for sure. And it's exciting. I mean, it's a new WoW expansion. It definitely is. But uh, I think <laughs> the, the, the more I I watch videos like this and stuff, I think it it makes me understand that Blizzard really does have two products here. They have Classic WoW for people that share mindsets like my own a lot of the times. And then we have a different product that's retail and they're they're it's 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 a very different product these days. And I and purposefully a different product, right? For a different consumer. And uh and I can see why there's like this great divide so to speak between the two different player bases. I think I'm in an interesting position because I played retail like my whole life and then more recently i've been starting to play classic and reigniting my love for the the things that made wow wow in the first place and then i see retail moving away from that and on purpose right on purpose they're moving away from that to to rediscover what it means to 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 play world of warcraft and they're trying new stuff and i, I guess i commend it it scares me a bit i think as as someone who likes those fundamental things but uh hey man maybe it'll be great so there's that man everything you need to know about war within we actually did learn a lot from wow <laughs> We saw the upload in the first three minutes, dude. There we go.